The Lord be with you. And also with you. And Kathy, I forgot. The Lord be with you. <laughs> All right. Well, just a, just a quick restart there. So, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bonaire United Methodist Church. Uh, I, I had not even gotten it out of my mouth for Kathy to do the chime immediately after that crop walk, and I forgot within 45 seconds. Didn't remember. So anyway, we got it, though. So it's good to see everybody, and uh, I hope you're here to enjoy a day of worship. You come to, to hear the Spirit move in your life, to enjoy just being in the presence of God and one another. If you're visiting with us today, we're glad you're here. Just make yourself at home. We're, we're a collection of people from all over, and uh, I've noticed that a lot of times people who might not be as new as others think everybody here knows everybody else but not so not so we're always getting to know each other no matter how uh, long or how short a time we've been here there is an attendance register on your row if you could send it down we'd have a record of your being with us i'm burt brooks senior pastor and preacher today the reverend kathleen monge is assisting in worship Kathy Toole is our Minister of Music, and we have our Sanctuary Choir today who will be providing our, our music for us. We also have a couple of little special editions today that will appear at just the right time. So, at just the right time. We have some good announcements in the, in the bulletin today. A lot of things going on, and uh, instead of going over them, uh, you, please read them, everything from golf to apples to children's drama and music book study secret saint volunteer opportunities wednesday night dinner crop walk go ahead and let somebody know that you're interested in some of these things and we want to get you plugged in so um i'll just depend on you to let us know that you'd like to be part of some of these things kathleen did you have anything for this group today thank you for the short-term memory <laughs> okay, so we have a deal. We always speak with our names. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good enough. Well, let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
For those who are able, I would invite you to please stand for our call to worship. With all your strength, sing aloud to the Lord who has brought you here and blessed you. Our voices shall shout forth praises and thanksgiving to God. With all your heart, reach out in service to those in need, remembering God's mercy in your own life. Our lives shall be witnesses to the love of God which has been lavished upon us. Come, let us worship the Lord with great joy. Let us bring all that we have and all that we are to God in gratitude. Amen. Before you're seated, if there are children around you, I'd like to invite them to come up for children's time. And then would you turn and welcome your neighbor to Bonaire United Methodist Church this morning.
All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Well, it's good to see you today. Thanks for coming up. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, our Bible lesson today, but in just a, before I do that, let's do our greeting. Jesus loves me every day, and every day Jesus loves me. Hey, do you know anything about important papers? Important papers. Do your parents or grandparents have a place they keep important papers? Do you have a, any idea, maybe? Come on up. Well, important papers we keep in safe places. Now, some people have a box they keep their important papers in, right? A shoe box, maybe. Some can lock it. Others keep it at the bank, in the vault, in what is called a safe deposit box. Important papers. Do you know where they kept important papers back in Bible times? I'm not even going to make you answer it. They put their important papers in a jar, stuck them down in the jar, sealed the jar, dug a hole in the ground, put the jar in the ground. What do you think of that? That doesn't seem very safe for your important papers, does it? Why do you think they did that? They didn't have banks, you're right, at least not the way we have. I tell you, you already know this story, don't you? Um, but that is exactly right. That's how they kept their important papers. They might have put them in a cave and put a rock up front. They may have buried them in a special place in the ground. But I want you to listen today because Jeremiah is going to buy some land and they're going to put the important papers in a jar. How about that? So listen for that Bible story. And it's good to see you today. And I'm so glad you could come up and visit. Let's have a prayer before you go. Can you repeat after me? Dear Lord, thank you for loving us and giving us a good life. Amen. Thanks. See you. Hey, do you want to stay up here with me? Uh, you can. <laughs> love that, love that. Well, as they are heading back and as we prepare for our prayer time, I'd like to ask you, does anybody have any joys or celebrations in our midst today? Any good news that you want to share anywhere? Okay, speak boldly. Where are you? Okay, Joanne. I'm going to brag on my youngest son. Jamie is an attorney, and he excuse me, lives in Portland, Oregon. And he has been appointed to the Multnomah, Multnomah County Circuit Court bench. He is going to be a judge. He's going to be a judge, your son. Yeah, if you didn't hear that, that's exciting. And, and tell me again where he's located. Portland, Oregon. Okay, well, that's exciting. You didn't see it coming when he was a little boy, did you? <laughs> I've never mentioned it. Well, that is good news. Yes, any other good news for us this morning? All right. Okay, well, done. We've heard, and we even have her. I was going to mention her on the prayer list in just a minute. So that's good news. Yes, indeed. And you all, had you gotten back in from your trip? Cut it, short. Cut it short to come home. Well, we're glad you're back, and I'm glad there's good news. Yes, good. Nancy, did I see a... Yeah. It's a good day to be a Wahoo. Good day to be a Wahoo. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, um, well, you know, I, I try to be nonpartisan when I uh, come to church when it comes to football, but I know that uh, that's exciting times. Uh, these folks don't know it, but I'm a graduate of Virginia Tech. 
And, uh, uh, but I don't say, I keep it to myself. I keep it to myself because I want to celebrate our Virginia teams. But um, anyway, that is good news. And I've heard some folks uh, talking about it since Martha Mavridi's got here early this morning. She's been uh, <laughs> talking about that. Good. I'm, I'm not, I, I can't remember. I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm just being a Christian today. Okay. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to stay on God's team today. <laughs> Eileen, you got a joy for us? Granddaughter Sarah McKenzie. So she got her master's degree on the day that would have been her father's birthday. So she is she is making good progress. Well, good. Eileen and Bill, congratulations. Yeah. All right. Well, good everyone, and um, hope you're hope this week you're going to have a lot of joys and celebrations that you can share next week. Uh, we mentioned Shirley, and, um, and she is doing well. Dan Delaro and Verla Burgess, who I have on my list this morning. Do you have anybody? That's who that I have on add? my list. Okay, well, I, I, I'd also uh, lift up Claire Crostick. Is that okay, Mary, that we lift her up in prayer? Okay, yeah. okay. thank you. All right. We're going to lift Claire as well. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Okay. Join your hearts with mine. Let us pray. Sovereign God, that opening hymn we just sung together reminds us that you are beyond what we can understand or comprehend, but we are grateful, Lord, that you sent your Son to be incarnate, the Christ. Thank you. That simple reminder that we are all your children is very important for all of us today. As we gather to worship, as we celebrate wonderful news of children and grandchildren, but it is also important as we come before you, as your children remembering that there are others of your body, Christ's body, the church, that are suffering struggling with illnesses, trying to discern the next step in their lives. And because we are one, when one of us suffers, all suffers. And when we expand that, Lord, to beyond these four walls, we are reminded that many of our brothers and sisters are suffering and struggling with some of the basics of life including homelessness, and yet you work through your children as servants to address issues of homelessness, hunger, and thirst. So we do remember those who are being devastated by hurricanes and storms and droughts. As we come before you, Lord, we do lift up to you the men and women who are in positions of leadership around your world, in our nation, elected and appointed officials that make decisions that affect all of our lives. Please, O oh Lord, give to these men and women wisdom, your wisdom that will guide them to not seek self, but seek decisions that help others. We come before you, Lord, opening our hearts and our minds to you as you continue to nudge each and every one of us to be ministers to others, making assessments of opening doors or 
helping somebody who seems very a very small deed, but in that way is serving you. As we are your children, as we are your servants, as we are your son's disciples here in the 21st century, continue to work through us that others may come to know you as a God of love. This prayer I lift in the name of Jesus, who taught us to boldly pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In our first reading from Psalm 91, we are assured of God's protection. Listen now for the word of God to us. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror in the night, or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Here ends the first lesson.
The second reading is from Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 6. Listen again for God's word to us this day. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life, to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, in his, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, it is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that is really life. This is the word of God for all God's people. Oh, hello. I am Agent Hamill from Anatoth Real Estate. Welcome to our open house. Fresh baked cookies, anybody? This is a unique property, and I am so glad you're interested, especially with the upcoming invasion of Babylon. Dun, dun, dun. Most people aren't looking into purchasing property. Not a lot of folks are investing in real estate these days. Business has been touch and go. But I have faith this market is going to get better. And my prayer is God has told me to have faith that this will get better. Please have a look around. show you much nicer places. No, 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 this is the one. I can uh, do some renovations. Knock out this wall here. Ah! Pull up some carpet here. Ugh. Do some landscaping. The Lord will guide me. This is the place. Very well then, sign this deed. And this, this first deed 
goes in the glass jar to help preserve it. Okay. The second, you keep for yourself, for awesome. your records. Oh. Okay. Interesting. All right. Yeah, very well. Here's the moolah. Thank you. Good luck, cousin. Good luck. Money. <laughs> ah. This place is great. Uh, now to get to work. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Showing me the way. The <laughs> end. <laughs> Well, that, that skit was certainly based on the book of Jeremiah, and you know how sometimes when you put it to the Hollywood version, uh, you don't get all of the details that the book has. So I'm going to share with you now where that wonderful script came from. And it came from the book of Jeremiah. It said, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadrezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the place of the king of Judah, where King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of your uncle Shalom, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anatoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, Buy my field that is at Anatoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy. And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Messiah in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In the presence I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so our skit was a real estate transaction, as you could tell. And the number one rule of real estate is what? Location, location, and location. And so what I say about this field at Anatoth is not. It went against all rules of real estate. But it was a simple transaction. That transaction was very much like the transaction other than putting it in a jar. The paperwork was as minimal as it was when I bought my first house uh, 35, 40 years ago. I think I signed two pieces of paper. One was the deed and one was the mortgage, and I think that was it. Of course, recently, uh, we refinanced our mortgage, and they don't make an earthenware jar large enough to put all that paper in, do they? How many people know what I'm talking about? How many have done this? I mean, it is paper after paper after paper after paper in order to get this thing done. And even to get it to that point, it's about three times more paper just to get it to the point of the paper that you sign and you keep. Uh, Chris, you know all about that, don't you? you and, uh, and so, very much, this was a land sale, 
and according to the law, uh, Jewish law, it sounds like the land was in bankruptcy or foreclosure. Therefore, Jeremiah got first right to that land by way of being the closest kin. Now, this is an interesting story, is it not? Because Jeremiah is in prison. He's in prison. Must be one of those executive prisons that have a you know, business room in them with uh, all you need. But apparently they came to the courtyard where the guard were located and they, they made the transaction. Now the town is Anathoth, or Anathoth. Now something interesting about this town, this is Jeremiah's birthplace, his hometown. This is where he prophesied. This is where people disliked him because of his prophecies. And so he's in prison in his hometown. God has said, buy this piece of land in your hometown. So he would know this land wouldn't like he was going to a new community somewhere and buying something. But the reality is this area was under siege by the Babylonians. It was a war zone. And he's going to be buying property in the middle of a war zone? I don't know if that's a good idea. I don't know if you buy property right now in some of the war-torn areas of the world. But it wasn't that the property was going to be developed. I don't think Jer Jeremiah ever left prophet status and decided he was going to develop condos there in Anathoth or whatever you do with raw land. This land was not about what this land could produce right here. This land was about a symbol. It was about God saying right here in the least obvious of places, I am going to show you that there is hope for my people. And he went to the worst neighborhood in the most besieged area and he said, buy this piece of land. It was a sign that God was going to restore God's people. Now if you've been following this for the last four weeks, we have been taking selective movements out of Jeremiah. It's a long book. It's one you can't read from start to finish. You, you know, you'll, you'll end up changing careers before you ever get to the end of <laughs> Jeremiah. It's just that long. But when you pick out the major themes of that book, it really does take some definitive turns. When we start reading it, we gather that God is, is just ready to destroy the people. They have followed other gods, they have forsaken everything and their history along with it so that they might just do their thing. And there are words in, in Jeremiah that just seem so, so uh, destructive, such as the carcasses of this people shall be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth and nothing will, will be there to frighten off these birds. I will silence the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. The sound of mirth and gladness will be gone. Kind of that doom and gloom prophet, Jeremiah. Stuff recycles itself all the way through. But then we see some beautiful passages. Go down to the potter's house and watch that the potter is remaking the pot. Because if you, you were here on the first Sunday, we, had the, we, we introduced the image of the cracked pot, a beautiful piece of earthenware. But once that crack got in it, it would not serve its purpose anymore. To pour water in it, the water all comes out. It's like our lives. We are creations of God. I knew you and knit you together in the womb. God created this beautiful earthenware pot this humanity that is to hold God's goodness and to share God's goodness. How oftentimes in Scripture do we hear, my cup runneth over the abundant life, not my life leaked out all of God's blessing, but it ran over and blessed others. And then we saw another turn last week. Is there not a balm in Gilead? And... God was speaking through Jeremiah that God is the healer of all people and all things. Is there not a physician there for my poor people? This week we hear Jeremiah go and buy that land. And the last verse of this scripture was this. 
I'll read it to you one more time. Houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. In other words, restoration. Bringing it back to its full potential. Have you heard people speak words of restoration? Sure you have. It's like, I'm so glad to be back. That's a word of restoration, isn't it? I'm cancer free. Um, those are the kinds of things that you see are pulling people out of their fears. It's good to be with you. You know, these things that say, I was here and now I'm here. I was over here struggling with something, but now I have been restored. And those are always a joy. We hear them in our joys and celebrations, especially when there's a good report and there's good news and, and people have been, been able to overcome the issues and the sicknesses and the illnesses and the challenges in their life. It literally is restoration. But restoration is, is what hope is all about. Hope is what we as Christians have that we offer the world. Can you imagine who is going to pick up the, the idea of hope if we don't advance it? Who's going to take it? Who's going to take hope over? Are we going to give it to the government? Are we going to give it to science? Are we going to give it to medicine? Are we going to give it to education? Are we Are going to give it to who if we don't practice it and live any of that? Faith, hope, love. Who gets that if we as God's people don't continue to live it out. You know, from time to time there is a complaint about Christians and I mean, Lord knows I, I can't list all of them today because we do want to eat lunch eventually, but um, when Christians lose hope, that is a true tragedy. When Christians cannot see God's brighter future, no matter how dark it is now, we are ones that are trained to see the light. We are trained to see even the glimmer of light. We started a new Bible study on Wednesday night in the book of John. And that powerful verse, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. This is an amazing, profound understanding of who God is in our lives. We all have our symbols of hope. Or we may not, I don't know, I just made a broad statement, I don't know who it applies to, but I suspect some people relate to it. The church has symbols of hope. It has a cross, a dove, flame, the movement of the wind, the cup, the loaf, all of those are our symbols of hope. Others have their own symbols of hope. Many people wear something around their wrist that says what they believe in and what they hope for. Some people put it right on their skin and wear it for the rest of their lives of what's important and what their values are. Others put it on a t-shirt. Life is good. I like that one, don't you? You have a life is good t-shirt. I can't afford them, but I like them. You know, I'm waiting for goodwill to stock up on them when I, next time I'm there. But we live out of our symbols, do we not? When I do a wedding, it's something like this. These rings are an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. Symbols. Not everybody has to wear their symbols, but I suppose most people have images in their head about something that brings forth the memory of hope. You may have your own. It may be some poem. It may be a visualization. I always like when I see a sprout coming up out of desolate ground. Ground that has been burned over by fire. Ground that has been covered over by volcanic ash. And ground that has been declared useless. And yet somehow life springs out of that ground. It is all, it's the same with the human life. So oftentimes I think people think their life has become useless. That I've aged out of any value. And of course there's no truth in that. Or that I've missed my calling in life. Or that, that uh, I live a life full of regrets. 
But you see, green new life can sprout out of even the most desolate places and the most desolate lives. I do believe that if we take anything away from this, we take away that God's sign of hope are signs that are literally everywhere in our lives. We just need to be able to see them. Paul writes, for we walk by faith, not by sight. But when I say see them, I know what I'm looking for. I know that I'm looking for signs of God's grace. Does that mean that all will be well? Does that mean that Jeremiah and the people he lived around are all of a sudden made well? No, actually, if you continue reading that book, it doesn't sound like it gets any better. But the hope is restored. So I, I think what we take away from here is that old saying, and I don't know if this is biblical or not, hope springs eternal. Is that in the Bible? I don't think it is. It's what we call extra canonical. It's things that we've made up that we're going to put in the Bible next time it gets rewritten. We're going to add that. But it is certainly something to live by. It is certainly something that gives us reason to wake up every day. It is certainly something that helps us live the abundant life. And so my challenge to you today is very much the same challenge. Do something with this. Put it into practice. Don't let these words just lay on this floor and be trampled over as we leave today. But take them with you and offer hope to those who seem to have sunk into darkness or to some sense of despair. And don't let them talk you out of hope. They're good at that. Don't let them talk you down from knowing that God loves them. Don't let them back you up by saying there is nothing for me to live for. Yes, there is. And we can be witnesses of that. We can be the ones who live with hope. And I think hope then rubs off on other people. Don't you think so? Hope rubs off on other people. I give you one of my challenges that I always believe in. I say, if you want to change the world, then you can start by changing yourself. If you want a better world, then you create a better world that begins with you. If you want to see the best of people, then offer the best in you to people. If you want to change, then it can be done because we are the people of God. It was just a symbol. Land probably was no good. They were fighting on all directions. But God said to Jeremiah, buy this land because good things shall happen. Thanks be to God. Amen.
It is a time when we have the opportunity and the privilege to return to God a portion of the gifts which we have been so abundantly blessed. And I just realized it was Georgia Harkness that wrote those words, Hope of the World. What a powerful, powerful message for each and every one of us. Would the ushers please come forward? I invite you to join with me in the prayer of dedication. Mighty creator, you are the exit of the cosmos and of the tiniest flower. We bring gifts to you this morning, not as restitution for past mercies or prepayment for a future favor, but as a celebration of your love and care for us and all creation. Dedicate these gifts that they might bring love and compassion, that they might help heal your creation and help us more resemble the people you desire us to be. In Christ we pray. Amen.
Go forth now in peace. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you and be with you all today and forevermore. Amen.